Thank you. Thank you very much, Vijay. You've done a wonderful job, and I'm very happy to participate in this uh, lovely seminar. Uh, I, actually, Prakash has uh, covered this whole subject admirably well, and there's very little left for anyone to comment or even to ask, as a matter of fact. I may just say that 40% of people with lung cancer uh, would have metastasis in the brain. And therefore, naturally, in most of these patients, life expectancy is poor, particularly uh, if they are not treated, then the expectancy would be something like less than six months. And um, peculiarly, sometimes, and I have operated on at least uh, a few patients where metastasis in the brain is diagnosed first and then in the other organs, even the lung. So that's, of course, uncommon, but because we do investigate them, at least from this chest x-ray point of view and such things. But if there's a, uh, but sometimes we do have a solitary mets in the brain uh, with no indication of cancer anywhere in the body. There was a question about how many mets can you operate? And uh, that's an interesting question. And I too also do not stop at once. If I can manage up to three mets in the same operation, then I would uh, do it. Uh, especially, you should not ignore a posterior fossa mets. Because any meds in the posterior fossa, well, the room is extremely narrow, small. No space available for any expansion because of the brain stem in its vicinity would warrant. So even if you have, uh, let us say, two meds and patient is only, uh, you know, will be able to withstand only one operation or only one operation, then I would go for the posterior fossa meds first because that's the one where uh, space is at a premium. And... Uh, so up to three, up to three mets, and even if the tumors are large, sometimes I would operate on them. It doesn't really matter. And some of these mets are in close cluster, you know, two or three of them, but they may be in close vicinity. So at times in the same craniotomy, you may be able to uh, remove all of them. Avic surgery, of course, has given us the opportunity to operate in eloquent areas too, and just like any other tumor. In fact, it is easier to operate on. Uh, metastatic disease because it's always well localized compared to a primary brain glioma which is at times diffuse and we operate still in those patients also in the uh, eloquent areas with awake surgery so awake surgery is uh, available i have operated on several motor area tumors now with awake surgery and uh, if of course the patient develops some uh, problem then you wait you can give the patient about 15 20 minutes time to recover uh, from a transient deficit and you may still be able to continue. Occasionally, the patient may throw a fit. That's another problem with awake surgery. In which case, we need to have some cold water. Always, whenever we are doing awake surgery, there should be cold water available in the theater. It should be kept ready so that you can directly irrigate the brain with ice cold water and the convulsion would stop. A seizure alone would not be an indication to stop surgery. But if they are repetitive, then of course you need to do that. So, uh, metastases are well defined and we are, uh, in fact, it's easier to operate on METS than to operate on a primary glioma of the brain. Um, I think the rest of it has all been said uh, by Prakash very well. Yes, he also mentioned about leptomeningeal METS are not a, a indication for surgery, but sometimes you may have to do uh, injectable, you know, in the CSF pathway, you may have to do a a lumbar puncture and inject the uh, appropriate medication, chemotherapy, uh, uh, especially for these advanced lung cancer. And sometimes it's worthwhile doing because some of these patients with lung cancer can live longer lives today. And therefore, even if you have a leptomeningeal meds, which is worthwhile injecting them, uh, you may be able to, even if the survival rate of this is six to eight weeks only, uh, six to eight, yes, even then I would uh, inject them. So it may be, of course, targeted therapy is still better. Um, I think I have uh, covered most of the points that I wanted to make. Uh, if there are still any more questions, we should be able to answer them if there is time. I don't know. Anyone has any question for Dr. Turel? Yeah. Yes, sure, sure, we ask the question. So, is there any quality of life assessment studies post SRS and post surgery? Sir? Yes, I see quality of life. Quality of life uh, studies are done for uh, every neurosurgical. 
patient ideally both before operation also and after operation now in one simple way what dr prakash showed you was uh, kps to uh, karnovsky performance scale as you know that's a scale from 1 to 10 or 10 or uh, up to 100% so anything well he said anything less than 70 would be uh, considered as a unfavorable uh, candidate for surgery uh and we are talking about cancers i can understand but there are many benign tumors that i have operated with lower karnovsky scale even very recently i operated on somebody with uh, 40 kps with a foramen magnum meningioma and this tumor was lying right in front of the cervical cord and medulla but this was a meningioma it was a benign tumor the patient came with almost quadriplegia very poor scale but i knew that by removal of this surgery by removal of this tumor i would be able to uh, offer good quality of life uh, if there are no surgical mishaps and true enough so kps is one factor but the other factor is what is the disease going to do with the patient so if you have a favorable disease then uh, a poor kps also does not contraindicate surgery but as you know in malignancy in cancers especially in uh, secondary deposits where cancers already broken loose from the primary organ then uh, you have to weigh very carefully whether it is worth by putting the patient through all this rigmarole of surgery chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy and whether it is better to uh, leave them alone uh to their destiny so these are things which have to be taken on an individual case case to case also depending on the patient's general condition and what the family thinks about it i think it's very important to in such instances to have a conference with the family because the uh, ultimate care caregivers are the family members any other questions whatever you have in mind you can ask there are you are at present talking to one of the most knowledgeable person in neurosurgery anyone has any question even if however silly it is thank you sir no further questions for you thanks a lot for joining us sir thank you thank you, yeah. thank you very much excellent